Turn with me, if you will, to the New Testament book, Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, and we'll begin reading with verse 10. Paul says to the Philippians, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last you care for me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful but lacked opportunity. Not that I, res that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therefore to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound, Everywhere and in all things I am instructed to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have done that ye have communicate with my aff affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once again to my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire the fruit that may abound on your account. But I have all, and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphrodites the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet, sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians is one of the letters that Paul wrote while he was in prison in Rome. And he wrote to a Gentile church that he founded in northern Greece. The letter, especially the portion that we just read, is a thank you note for a gift that he had recently received. Paul was very grateful for the gift, as we read in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, but also made it very clear that his gratefulness was not out of want. In verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, Paul was grateful, not necessarily for the gift itself, but for what it represented. First off, it, it represented, it was a sign to Paul that the church was once again flourishing, in verse 10. And secondly, from verse 17, we read that he desired the fruit that the gift would produce. When we give to our missionaries, we share in the fruitfulness of those missionaries and bring the word of Christ to the unsaved. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your bountiful gifts to us, for your mercy, for your grace, and for your forgiveness. We ask this morning that you Send the Holy Spirit to guide us, to give us understanding in this study of your word that we may apply this understanding to our daily lives, that we may gain a little insight into your will for our lives through this example from your word. Amen. Now, Paul had not received anything from uh, the, the church in, uh, in Philippi uh, he had founded the church about 10 years earlier. Uh, so he was very grateful uh, in, in receiving a gift from that. He, he understood that uh, the reason that he hadn't received anything, uh, as we read, that uh, it was because they, they lacked resources. They, they didn't have much to give. But they managed to sacrifice to pull together and sacrifice a gift to send to Paul. We read in verse 18, Paul calls their gift a sacrifice, acceptable and well-pleasing to God. So how large must a gift be to be acceptable and well-pleasing to God? Remember in Luke 21, Christ said that the widow who put two mites into the offering plate 
gave more than all the others. It is not the size of the gift. It's what's in the heart. What it boils down to is our wants versus our needs. Paul recognized the difference. In verse 11, he says, not that I speak out of respect of want. Then in verse 19, he states, God shall supply all your need. How often do your do children go to their parents with a statement like, you know, I, I really need this new pair of $150 sneakers. I, I absolutely have to have it. It's, I need it. And we try and teach our children, no, you, you don't need the sne- sneakers. You, you want the sneakers, but you don't need them. It, it's hard to help them to understand. It's hard for us to understand because don't we do the same thing? We ourselves are children. We are children of God, children of the Father. And how often do we go to the Father in prayer saying, Oh, God, I I really need this new job. I really need this new car if you could just supply my needs. No, you don't need that stuff. We don't need earthly possessions. God supplies our needs. He, just like other parents, we will supply wants of our children. We want our children to be happy. We want them to enjoy themselves. So we we do supply their wants on occasion. But we always, without failure, we always supply their needs. And God does the same for us. God tells us in Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. He will give us our wants, but he promises to give us our needs. He promises to supply us our daily bread. So we have no need to worry about our needs. Now a butterfly, butterfly is an amazing little creature. Uh, we, We often use the example of a butterfly to to explain to someone how, how life-changing it is to become a Christian, about how we will, when we meet Christ in glory, we will be given a new body. That the butterfly, when it wraps itself up in a cocoon, it, it secretes a, a, a liquid that actually dissolves all of their internal organs. It, for, for lack of a better word, it turns everything to mush. It's a true miracle that a butterfly evolves out of that. Scientists don't even know how it happens, but that, in that mush, while they're in the cocoon, a, a brain, a heart, all the internal organs redevelop, and it develops into a beautiful, majestic butterfly. Now, some of you may be a little confused now. Okay, so what does butterflies have to do with our needs? And and what about the sermon title, Are You Smarter Than a Butterfly? Well, bear with me a little bit and you'll soon understand. A little bit of patience. Reminds me of a a story I heard about a little boy named Timmy. Little Timmy and his mother were driving home from church and, and little Timmy asked his mother, he said, Mom, what's the biggest number you ever counted to? And Mother said, well, I, I really don't know. I don't think I've, I've ever tried to count to a large number. I, I couldn't tell you. And Timmy proudly told his mother, I counted to 3,457. Mother thought, oh, wow, that, that's kind of strange. That's an odd number. Why would you count all the way up to, to that large a number and then just stop? Little Timmy turned to his mother and said, well, that's when the sermon was over. So I ask you, have a little patience, bear with me a little bit, pay attention, and I'll try and explain about are you smarter than a butterfly? Jeff Foxworthy, a well-known comedian, I'll I'll bet most of you, if not all of you, have heard of. He's, He's famous for his, you're probably a redneck if jokes. Uh, if some of you may have uh, a cable TV or satellite TV where you get the, uh, the game show network, 
Jeff Foxworthy has a couple of game shows on that network. He, uh, he's, he's a well-known comedian. He, he got his start traveling with a group of other comedians, other well-known comedians whose, whose names I'm not going to mention, but you will surely recognize. Um, many people don't know that Jeff Foxworthy is a Christian. Uh, that uh, in traveling uh, and starting out and traveling with that group of, of uh, comedians, uh, he left the group. He, he quit the tour because uh, he, he didn't like all the foul language and off-color jokes that the other comedians were telling. He just, he just couldn't be in their company anymore and uh, uh, left that tour for what some people thought would be a, a career-ending move. Um, before his career ever even started. But they were wrong. Uh, if you watch that, that game show network on, on some cable TVs, he, he's got a game show called uh, The American Bible Challenge, which uh, I, I don't know if you've seen it. I've watched it quite a few times. It's, it's very, very informative. Some of the contestants on those shows, the Bible trivia questions they ask, they, they put me to shame. Let me tell you... Uh, uh, it's not an easy thing to go through, but the contestants compete to uh, win prize money they give to their favorite charities. But Jeff Foxworthy also has another show, another game show on that network called Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Sounds real simple. All you have to do is answer 11 questions taken directly from the textbooks of first through fifth grade students. Answer the 11 questions correctly, you win a million dollars. You even have a group of fifth grade students on stage with you that you're allowed to cheat off of. And yet, in the six years that this show has been on the air, not one person has won the million dollars. They've had rocket scientists, they've had college professors, They've even had, I, I forget his name, that, that, uh, that game show champion that, that won all those millions of dollars on Jeopardy. Uh, he, I, I watched that show. He got up to that last question and he chickened out. <laughs> he didn't want to risk the half a million dollars that he already had won for the full million. Uh, so let, let's shift gears a little bit more and I'll explain about this butterfly thing. Two years ago, I, I took my two grandsons on a, on a trip to Seattle, my, my frequent fire miles were about to run out. I figured, well, I'm, I'm going to use them before they take them away. So I took them to Seattle to visit my sister. And while we were there, we went to the, uh, uh, the Pacific Science Center, which is uh, on the grounds where the old Seattle Fair was, where, where the Space Needle is and so forth. We went into that uh, science uh, uh, center and, and in there they had a butterfly exhibit. Walk into a, a, a room, a glass enclosed room and see all these exotic butterflies flying around. A uh, perfect environment set up by the custodians, the, the perfect temperature, humidity, the perfect amount of sunlight which they had to supply artificially because we all know about the cloudiness and raininess of Seattle. Um, but as you walk through and look at all these beautiful butterflies, if you look up, you can't help but notice that up on the glass ceiling were hundreds of butterflies trying to get out of that perfect environment. They, they saw the, the blue skies once in a while when they did show up in Seattle, and, and they wanted what was outside of their environment. They were supplied with everything that they could possibly need. The perfect environment, the perfect temperature and humidity, the perfect food to sustain them. And they wanted more, they wanted out. Are we smarter, any smarter than these butterflies? I, I, I think not. I think back to the story of Adam and Eve. They were created by God, they were placed in a garden, a perfect garden created by God, and they saw something that they wanted that was outside of what God had supplied, and they went after it and sinned. Are we much like that today? 
We can't sit back and just blame everything on Adam and Eve because of their desires. What about, about us? What about our desires? Are we satisfied with the things that God supplies to us? Or are we constantly looking for more, looking for things of this world? Do we recognize the fact that God does supply our every need? We don't need to struggle. We don't need to constantly battle and exhaust ourselves. God supplies our needs. We don't need to work for it. It's a free gift from God. Paul saw differently. In, in verses 11 through 13, Paul tells, tells us that he knows what it's like to suffer and to abound. He knows what it's like to be full and to be hungry. He knows what it's like to suffer a need and to abound in all glory. But he says in verse 13 that whichever state he is in, he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. In the early years, Paul was shunned by Christians because they remembered how he persecuted them he was shunned by the Jews because he was considered a, a traitor turning to Christ and, and teaching uh, the gospel. He was hated by the Romans because he stirred up trouble. And yet, he trusted in God and he was appreciative and, and understood that God had supplied all of his needs. So let's look at our, at our outline. The first point in our outline this morning, we want to look at the source of that supply. Paul says in verse 19, my God shall supply all your need. Remember now, Paul is talking to a church of Gentiles, a church mainly made up of Greeks at the time, who in their young, younger years may have worship many gods. Uh, the, the Greeks worshiped, they had a god for everything. And God made it clear to them here, it is my god that supplies all of your needs. The source of our supply is Paul's god, the god of Abraham, the god who created the heavens and the earth. He is the source that fills all of our needs. Christ tells us in Matthew 6, why do you worry for food and water? Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But first, seek the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be given to you. You don't have to work for it. It's a free gift of God. Luke 11, verses 11, 13, Christ says, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, would you give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would he give him a serpent? Or if he asked for an egg, give him a scorpion. If you then, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Christ reminds us that God is perfect and we are not. God is all-knowing, and we know little. Would the Father among us or, or, who are not righteous would give a stone to his son instead of bread? Just imagine how much more God would give to us. We sing in our doxology, we sing, praise to God from whom all blessings flow. Think about it. Almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God, our Father, who created the universe, knows every one of our needs and has promised to fill those needs. Why do we need to worry about such things? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be given. God the Father is perfect, and all-knowing, he knows what our needs are. We only think we know. But God knows all of our needs. We must, however, seek first his kingdom. 
set our minds on his will, seek out treasure of eternal things and not the things of this earth that will rust and decay. Lay up your treasure in heaven and all these things will be added to you, we're told in Matthew 6, 33. The second point in my outline, the scope of the supply. Once again, we look at verse 19. Paul says, but my God shall supply all your need. So what is the scope of God's supply? It is unending. It is eternal. It is everything. It is not limited in any way. We all have needs, and God has promised to fill those needs, even needs that we ourselves may not know about. God knows our needs and will supply them to you. Matthew 6, 32 and 33. The psalmist David sums it all up in a very simple, very short little verse in Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In, in our New American Standard, uh, it's, it's correctly interpreted, Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jehovah, Father, God of the... The universe, the God of Abraham, he is David's shepherd. David follows God Almighty, and as a result, he has no wants. He, he tells us later on in verse 5, he also wrote, My cup runneth over. God fills all of his needs, but not only fills those needs, his cup runneth over with needs. He has more than what he needs. He has no wants because God the Father supplies. Paul wrote nearly the same thing in verse 18 of Philippians 4. In verse 18 he says, but I have all and abound. I am full. And all this while he was in prison in Rome. Paul states that he not only has all that he needs, but he abounds and is full. While in prison, Paul also wrote to the Ephesian church. And in Ephesians 3.20, Paul says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think, our Father, our God, the same God of Abraham, David, and Paul, is all-powerful, all-knowing. He is limitless, without boundaries. And he has promised to supply your every need, to fill our cups to overflowing so that we can truly say we have need of nothing else. Thirdly, Let's talk about the standard of the supply. Look at Philippians 4.19 again. Paul says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Imagine you see a man, obviously, preoccupied about something, and, and he steps off the curb into a busy street. Just as he is about to be struck by an oncoming truck, you run over, grab him by the shoulder, and pull him back to the curb, saving his life. After you do that, you happen to notice that this man is a billionaire, Bill Gates or Donald Trump. And this man then turns to you, and being very grateful and thankful for saving his life, he pulls out his wallet and hands you a $20 bill. That $20 came out of his riches, but it was not according to his riches. God gives to us not out of his riches, not out of his abilities, but according to his riches 
and abilities. Almighty God, our Father, is limitless, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, and he wants to give you all that you need. God and Christ are perfect, and so are their gifts. When God fulfills your need, he does not fill it with junk. If the Lord God Almighty is our shepherd and we are his flock, read what Christ tells us in Luke 12, 32. Christ says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is the Father's good pleasure to give unto us, to supply our daily needs. He gives unto us the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded in all wisdom and prudence. And again in Ephesians 2, verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, in kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. How wonderful the gift of God's grace, giving to us the things that we do not deserve, things like forgiveness and eternal life. God also gives us from the riches of his glory. Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit, by the inner man. Again, in Romans 9, 23, that he might make known the riches of his glory in the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared unto glory. And in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How wonderful God's gift of mercy, not giving us the things that we do deserve. God also gives us from his riches of goodness. In Romans 2, 4, we read, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance? Only God is good, a perfect good. It is because of his goodness that that he can grant us grace and mercy. God also gives us from the riches of faith and love. In 1 Timothy 1.14 we read, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith, and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Are we smarter than a butterfly? Unlike those butterflies in the Science Center, we need to recognize that we have every need supplied to us. There's no reason to look outside and long for the things of this world. All the things of this world are temporary. They will eventually rust and decay. Don't store up worthless treasures here on earth, treasures of this world. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of our needs will be taken care of. The source of the supply, almighty God, our Father, through Jesus Christ the scope of our supply, everything that you can imagine, and then some. The standard of the supply, according to his abundant riches in grace and glory and goodness, faith and love. God our Father and Jesus Christ our Redeemer not only want to supply your every need, but they have promised to do so. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with praise in our hearts for your might, for your power, for your love, 
We thank you, Father, for your gifts, for your blessings that we see around us every day, for supplying us our daily bread, for giving us all that we need to survive and to worship and to praise your name. Thank you, Father, for the gift of the Holy Spirit and of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross to pay the penalty for sins that we've committed. Thank you, Father, for all these things, and pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, turn with me, if you will, to hymn number 285, Standing As We Sing. <laughs> hymn number 285, let's stand. And now to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.